Hello and welcome to Retro 48K for another technically correct video. In this episode I'm looking at the Super Nintendo, how it worked, how its graphics worked, what Mode 7 was all about and what happens with Mode 0-6. to But we'll get on to some of those in a minute. First off, how did the Nintendo work? It's much like the Mega Drive, let's look at the hardware first. So it had the picture processing units which are here on the chips and like the Mega Drive it had a CPU. The CPU was lower clocked, only about 3.5 megahertz but you could actually down clock it in code if you wanted to adjust the speed of the picture processing units because they produced a number of pixels based on clock cycle of the CPU. Picture processing units, picture processing unit 1 actually produced the backgrounds and sprites layers and picture processing unit 2 actually did effects and you think of it as processing a chip. But to understand how it then put graphics together in terms of the layers and scrolling and things like that, we need to look at some examples because it, it it's, can be quite complicated and it fits into the modes. So how was it all put together? So you start off with the screen that was 256 by 224 pixels. That was your main display area. Then on that you could have up to four backgrounds. So and these would be larger than the screen up to 1024 pixels and each of those could be scrolled and moved individually on need. You then had a sprite layer which could have things off screen if you wanted but that would be your sprites would then be moved around screen based on user input or AI things like that and again that could move independently of all that stuff. Now that looks a bit of a mess there but when you zoom in to what the user would see, you'll see that it's actually quite tidy and quite neat and that's the key trick to understanding the Super Nintendo. But to understand the rest of it, and before I go into Mode 7 and things like that, you can understand how memory was organised because a lot of it is due to limitations in hardware. So the Super Nintendo had different types of memory. It had work RAM, which was similar to what you have in your PC, it's just general purpose, and it could be expanded upon by up to a megabyte in cartridges. It then VRAM, which is where all your tiles and sprites and things were stored, uh, bits and pieces because they would be combined to make up them. It didn't store the colour values in this however. Sprites would be encoded with a value for the colour and that colour would then be used, uh, that value would then look up a value in colour RAM, which saved massively on sprites, it looked at least half the space they needed. In colour RAM, the Super Nintendo could have up to 256 colours. Each of those colours was made of 16 bits, well actually 5, one bit wasn't used, 5 for red, 5 for green and 5 for blue, which meant each of those 256 slots could be a one of hundred uh, sorry, one of thirty two thousand colours, which is a colossal amount compared to the 64 and 512 the Mega Drive had. So that's how sprites, colours, memory and all that good stuff worked. But in order to have it all combined together on screen, it had a thing called object memory. So the snares worked in objects, not sprites, and that's because an object could be made up of multiple sprites. So object memory would define what parts of tiles or sprites made up an object where it was on screen, its priority in front of the screen and things like that. It had room for 128 of these objects with 32 on any one scan line. And again, that was mainly what was used for scrolling and things like that. So that's all that stuff. Now we can get onto modes because modes are basically the Super Nintendo had loads of different ones and it's how it carved up memory and number of background layers and things like that. Think about it, gears on a car is a good way of thinking of it. Mode 0 was the first mode and it's the only mode that allowed four background layers. Each layer could be 32 colours and because it had 256 colours and there was only 32 per layer, none of them had to share colours. So they could all have their own area of colour memory each one set up and then the final 128 colours could be used for your sprites. It's actually very uncommon this mode was used because of the limitation in the colour layers and things like that and I'm struggling to find any footage. And what was actually a hell of a lot more common was mode 1 because that had a huge amount of colours. So mode 1 had two layers of 128 colours each and one layer of 32 colours. So obviously 
the two background layers of 128 colors had to share along with the 32 color layer and then you had your other 128 for sprites this wasn't such an inconvenience though because the two high color layers meant that a third layer could be used for a hood or you know a, a cloud layer or something that didn't have many colors in it and this was by far the most common mode most games used mode one moving on to mode two this only had two layers both of 128 colors each and again they had to share them it's slightly rarer but it's got some good examples in use so you had them two 128 colors but the key to this one the sacrifice of that third layer meant you could offset change per column. What it meant was tiles could be scrolled horizontally and vertically as they were needed. And Yoshi's Island and some other games use that neat effect, like this lava effect here is all offset change per column, moving background tiles individually. Mode 3, however, had a 256 colour background layer. 128 colour background layer, again, you're going to have to share, especially with that 256 colour layer because it uses all colour RAM. But it allowed for something called direct colour. So what direct colour did, it bypassed colour RAM, which meant that the sprite or tile information actually stored the colour information on it. So while it used more information, you had a much wider range of colours. However, you might, you wanted to carve that up. Again, it's not that often used. Mode 4, it again had two layers, 256 colour and 32 colour and you think of it as a combination of mode 2 and mode 3 and it, so it allowed direct colour, it allowed offset change per column the limitation of this was you could only scroll in either vertical or horizontal, not both at the same time Mode 5, this is an interesting one this one, you had a 128 colour layer and a 32 colour layer but what it did was it used this SNES's interlacing mode along with a double horizontal resolution to give you a double horizontal and vertical resolution. So what this did, basically, because you could have twice the horizontal of 512, but that would give you a squashed image. So clever developers could use interlace mode to use the scan lines to alternate the image on each scan line, basically giving you double the horizontal at uh, the vertical resolution as well so when you combine the two images with the human eye seeing them flash really quickly you ended up with an image that was actually double vertical double horizontal and twice the size of the layer moving on to mode 6 you had one layer in this case, it's exactly the same as mode 5 except it sacrifices the 32 colour layer to give you offset change per column, column. Again, this was a limited implementation of offset change per column in that you couldn't do both horizontal and vertical at the same time. Now the big one, mode seven. This is the one that everyone knows about. This allowed you to one background layer that was 256 colors, but it could be rotated, skewed, transformed, perspective shift with the help of HDMI, any which way you want and it's what give all them great effects in games like F-Zero and things like that. The trick to this layer though was that it, it's really complicated. It's, it actually put things in VRAM in a specific way to make the calculations easier so when you look at the memory it looks all skewed because they've organized it a certain way. It, um, had to be used with HDMI, like I said before, to get the perspective shifts, which is horizontal blank digital direct memory access, which again, I'd have to do an, its own video to explain what H blanks are and what direct memory access are. So I'm not going to go into it too deeply, but that is what Mode 7 was. You can actually spot Mode 7 from a mile off because it tends to only have one layer, like on Castlevania here where it's scrolling the entire screen while your sprites stay still. You can spot them a mile off, it, it's quite obvious. The only exception to this would be Mario Kart, where, like on this example here, it's actually scrolling, scrolling two images, um, and I'm not quite sure how they're doing this. I can only guess it's a trick with interlace mode where it's only refreshing at 30 frames per second or something like that in order to rotate them individually.
it's it's a neat trick and again I'd have to do my own video and a bit of research into what they're exactly they're doing there but that's the main graphics modes I haven't gone into a lot of things on there again I could do a full video on which are the effects so the first five modes have a thing called color maths and regions and mosaic effect is on all of the modes which the mosaic effect is quite tricky so on Mario World that um, blocky effect as you go in and out of levels and in and out of pipes that's the mosaic effect which can be applied to any every background layers and it's quite a nice trick that Nintendo used quite a lot to do transitions again on Mario World when you get the key and you put in the keyhole you get that region block where Rare used that brilliantly on Donkey Kong Country combined with color math to give cones of light so color math use the colour of the layers to then change another sprite layer so your character goes slightly blue as you go in the lights and it just shows you what a mastery Rare had of the hardware that they could pull this off it was brilliantly done and yeah and there's loads of examples of them using that one in various Donkey Kong Country games And it, but again I'd have to do a video of its own to explain colour math because it is quite complicated but I'm hoping this has given you a good overview of how the Super Nintendo worked and I've explained the mods well enough that you've got to understand it in them. If I haven't, please let me know in the description and I can cover areas that I've just maybe skimmed. Um, if you've got any questions, please put them in the comments um, or if you want to request another video. With that being said, thanks for watching. I'm Retro48K and I'll see you next time. Hi everyone, thanks for watching. There should be links and stuff on the screen right now for more videos. Check them out. And if you haven't done so, hit that like and subscribe button. See you next time.